Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Kendall Bonner, and I am your moderator for our panel this morning. Um, I am so grateful to have you guys here for Climate Future Day here hosted by Realtor.com at South by Southwest. Um, we have amazing panelists today and experts from uh, the chief economist from Realtor.com. We also have um, University of Texas Austin and First Street. Now, today we're here to talk about the intersection between real estate and climate. I think it's important that we understand that recent studies have shown there's a shifting paradigm that's occurring as it relates to home search for home buyers in our marketplaces. And I think it's important that, it, that we understand that's changing the landscape of home ownership as people need to be thinking about these things in ways that they haven't had to think about them in the past before because it's changing so rapidly. I also think it's important that we understand that we are going to have this amazing panel talk about, hopefully um, have this thought-provoking conversation and about the ramifications of climate change as well as natural disasters. And finally, I think we're going to talk about uh, navigating those complexities and talking about the future and what we need to do to create a more sustainable and resilient future. So with that being said, at the end, I do want you to know we will be doing live Q&A after the panel is over. So there will be a QR code on the screen that you can scan uh, to submit your questions so we can get those asked um, to our panelists at the end. We also will be having a happy hour and um, there will be an immersive experience afterwards. So please stay for um, that time after the uh, panel is over to enjoy that experience with us. So to get started, let me introduce our esteemed panel. I have Danielle Hale, the chief economist from Realtor.com. I have Matthew E.B. from First Street, who's the CEO and founder. And in the middle here, I have Professor Jay Banner from the Jackson School of Geosciences at UT Austin. So thank you. Can we give a round of applause to our panelists? Now, I'd like to start the discussion with you, uh, Jay. Can you please help set, set the stage for um, our audience and our listeners uh, regarding um, the state of the U.S., climate change? You know, talk to us about the foundation of where we are today and, of course, what climate change looks like right now. Right on. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Kendall. I find it pretty useful when talking about the current state of climate science is to really look at what predictions climate science makes about our future and, and our present with a warming atmosphere. And I do this simply based on the laws of physics. So if we continue to warm the atmosphere, as we have been for the last several decades, some of the consequences will be, as we warm the atmosphere, all other things being equal, we put more water vapor from the oceans into the atmosphere. We do that over the oceans. Uh, all things being equal, again, that'll lead to more intense rain events. On the other hand, if at the same time we warm the atmosphere over the land surface, that's going to rob the soil moisture uh, that, that exists, and that serves as a buffer against drought. So if we warm the atmosphere over land, rob the soil moisture, that will lead and trigger droughts that ordinarily would not have occurred, will make droughts that would have occurred be more intense and last longer. And finally, third thing is if we warm the atmosphere, we increase the temperature at the surface of the oceans. And at this, the temperatures at the surface of the oceans is kind of like the engine room for hurricanes. So we have higher sea surface temperatures. The projections simply based on the laws of physics that we will have more intense tropical storms and, and hurricanes. And if we look over the last couple of decades as being kind of present day, as, as you're asking about, what we're seeing are a number of record changes. The record changes are in record rainfall events, record drought, record heat, and these are all fully consistent with these changes predicted by climate science. And so I think it's important to keep all of this in mind, that theory and uh, what we're actually seeing in practice are all coming forward uh, to, to, to bear on our situation today. And I think the changes that we're already seeing, like over these past two decades, are already beginning to impact almost every major sector of our society. We consider ecosystem services, we consider water resources, public health, 
the value of land, and on and on, uh, workforce productivity. All of these major sectors of our society are already being impacted, and the projections are that those impacts will be more intense. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Matt, I'd like to include you in this conversation. First Street leverages data. Talk to us how about the data that you've been able to aggregate regarding this particular topic and how that's impacting. Sure. Uh, so at, at First Street, we take all of the information that Jay was just talking about uh, around uh, a warming planet and the emissions that we're putting out, and we translate those into what will actually be the changing weather patterns, be it flood, wildfire, heat, hurricane winds, air quality, and we are able to then understand these risks today and then how we expect that them change over the next 30 years. So what we're able to tell you is at a property level, what is that risk today given the current environment and the current situation that we're in? And then how would we expect that to evolve? And because we're doing that at the property level, we're able to aggregate these stats up to then understand how these things are expected to change. And so from a flooding standpoint, we know that today, because things have changed over time and the way that flood maps are made and, and kind of uh, distributed overall to your average American is through FEMA and the FEMA Special Flood Hazard Areas. Those now, because they're looking at historic information, aren't necessarily correct for today, nor will they be in the future. So when we look at our models, we see that there are 10 million properties that are outside of that special flood hazard area, but have that same level of risk that would make it in a special flood <coughs> hazard area. And because of climate change, we expect that to grow to 12 million properties over the next 30 years. So as these events are getting more severe, more properties are impacted. This is very similar to wildfire. On average, we expect currently 17,000 structures to be destroyed or burned down in a given year. This is not every year it's going to be 17,000. There are ups and downs within that, but that is what our models are telling us that we can expect in a given year. Over the next 30 years, we expect that to double. So this is not looking at new properties being built and there's more properties that could be impacted. If everything stays the same from a development area, climate change is getting hotter, causing fuels to dry out, causing those wildfires to be more likely or to burn in larger areas and impact more properties. So you're going to see a doubling of those impacted properties. And similar things for hurricane winds. When you actually look at the average annualized loss is expected from winds, uh, we expect that to almost double again to $20 billion in a given year, so an average annualized loss. So these are just some of the stats that we're seeing from the data that we're able to collect at a property level and then aggregate up to understand what are we expecting over the next 30 years because of climate change. Wow. Well, you know what I love about this, or it takes me back to my college days, which was wow, over like 25 years ago, and we had a saying in college, text without context is pretext, meaning information without explanation can be misinterpreted, right, and be false. And so I love that we're getting text and context with this. And so, Danielle, I'd like to include you into this conversation, bring more context to the text and the data that we're learning here today. Um, talk to us about, um, you know, climate change and bring it into the real estate space and bring it into the real estate numbers for us. Yeah, so the great thing about First Street Foundation's data is that it is at a property level, which enables us at Realtor.com to take that information and put it on the property information that we display right where consumers are shopping. So when they're making decisions about where they want to live, whether they want to buy, whether they want to rent, whether they want to sell, they have that information right there with all of the other property information that they need to make good decisions. And I think, you know, to your point about how the, the impacts are big and society is starting to recognize how big those impacts are, we took a look at the data from First Street Foundation, matched it up with the data we have on housing value, and the numbers are mind-bogglingly large. How much real estate is going to be impacted by these changing risk factors? If we look um, <clears throat> just at the, the new factors that Realtor.com has just introduced, the heat index, the wind risk, and the air quality, 40% of homes in the United States valued at just under $20 trillion are at risk of these factors based on their location and how climate science projects that, that uh, they are likely to be affected today and into the future. So a lot of homeowners need to consider this information, which is why we want to make it available. And in addition, if you, if you factor in 
things like the flood risk and the fire risk that are already there. It really has a broad impact. And if consumers don't have this information, they can't factor it in when they're making decisions. So it's really important for us to provide this information. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It, it again, reminds me of a quick story. I live in Tampa, Florida, and my husband and I owned a condo on the beach in Daytona. And we sold it um, one summer, a couple of summers ago. And the purchaser was a buyer who was not from Florida. And he uh, purchased it cash. And as a result, self-insured. He did not purchase flood insurance or any type of um, condo or homeowner's insurance. And sure enough, not six months later, one of the hurricanes that was predicted to land and did land on the uh, west coast and traveled across the entire state running through uh, Sarasota, through the center of the state to Orlando, and then eventually came out the other side, Daytona, which is where this condo was, and went up the, the east coast of the US, and devastated the, the condo. In fact, it, the entire condo flooded. And which, you know, can you imagine spending for half a million dollars or four or $500,000 on a, on a property and then it being completely and gutted, <laughs> needing to be completely repaired. And that really um, signaled to me how important it is that, especially as you relocate, that you have data like this, that you have information. Because I just imagine he probably just had no clue and how important this um, information is to purchasing uh, real estate into the future. So having said that, um, Danielle, um, talk to us about for prospective homeowners and, and buyers, right? Um, they need to think about climate change more. What, how do, can we relate that to the costs associated with purchasing homes and the maintenance of homes? Can you, can you bring that home for us? Yeah, so <clears throat> you mentioned the cost and the maintenance. Um, th it, with rising heat, you'll see, for example, that air conditioning becomes more of a necessity as opposed to a luxury because heat impacts both people, it impacts property, it means you're more likely to see maintenance expenses, whether it's to maintain the roof or to maintain this HVAC system. And I think it's also important to note that those HVAC systems also create more energy demands, which feed the energy usage that homes have and sort of exacerbate the, the ongoing needs. Um, from, for the other risk, it's, it's a lot of insurance impact. So you highlighted an insurance story. Uh, flood insurance, for example, is not included in homeowner's insurance. Homeowners have to be separately insured. And uh, the National Flood Insurance Program through FEMA is in the process of adjusting rates to better account for the risks of flooding, which have probably been underpriced historically, and especially to account for the fact that um, those risks are increasing. And then um, when it comes to wind, for example, hurricane deduct deductibles are an additional and separate deductible that homeowners may not be aware of as part of their in homeowner's insurance plan in 19 states in the District of Columbia. So there are extra costs to consider depending on the type of risk that we're talking about. And fire, which is also uh, you know, included as part of homeowner's insurance, is another risk for consumers to be aware of. But rising fire risk is making it more difficult for insurance companies to operate profitably in very high risk areas. And so in California, for example, some insurance companies have pulled out and the state has provided uh, an insurance of last resort uh, to help insure homeowners and, and make sure that they can protect against risk. So I think there are costs involved in maintenance, there are costs involved in insuring against these risks, and there are costs that can be undertaken to mitigate and prepare for these risks. So there are, there are lots of different costs, and having the information enables homeowners to have that information up front as opposed to after the fact so they can be better prepared. Yeah, and I imagine, too, that impacts um, not just the cost of homeownership, but also um, and maintenance and repair, but even inspections, you know, and the types of inspections you need to have to be prepared. Um, and I'm thinking, too, about roofs, right? Like significant heat and, and different things like that impacting roofs and needing to, you know, maintain and repair roofs going into the future, um, I'm sure is an, also an additional consideration. Um, Professor Jay, uh, <laughs> and I told you I wouldn't be able to resist it. <laughs> um, talk to us about what's happening here in Texas, you know, in particular um, water research and, and those types of factors. How is this climate change and, and water in Texas? Sure. Everything's bigger in Texas, and the <laughs> climate challenges are, are really big. If we first consider the global trends, right, the one is of increasing urbanization, the other is of the warming atmosphere. Texas sees these two synergistic impacts 
at much higher magnitude than almost anywhere else. It's kind of a climatological and demographic hotspot, if you will. What the model projections show is that by about 2070, this urbanization corridor we have here in Texas that goes, if you imagine, a southwest-northeast line from the Rio Grande Valley to San Antonio to Austin to Dallas-Fort Worth. There'll be twice as many people by 2070. And another thing there'll be are 80 more days, according to the model projections, 80 more days where it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. That's more. So we already have averaged over the last 15 years about 45 days where it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. So add 80 to that, it's 125. That's like four months. Wow. Happy to talk in the Q&A what that means. Where, all, where did four months fit on our calendar of where it's 100 degrees or more? That will lead to more extensive droughts. So imagine now this combination of synergistic impacts. Twice as many people, so the demand for water will go way up, right? right? Intense and longer droughts, where drought is sort of the new climate regime we have, that means the availability of water goes way down. So demand goes up, availability of water goes way down. And that is not a resilient look at our future. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we'll be increasing impervious cover. That's going to add to the urban heat island effect. That's going to add to degradation of water quality. Yet, in spite of all this, the demographers' projections, the demographers tell us that all these people will continue to move here to Texas. That doesn't look like a, a very resilient future for our state and our region. Well, I can't wait to get to that part of the Q&A because I definitely want to hear what you think is necessary to build a more resilient future. But before we get there, um, Matt, can you please share with us your point of view on all of this, you know, as it relates to um, the costs associated sure. and, and, and home ownership and the knowledge that home buyers and sellers will need yeah. going forward? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to build on, on what both um, Danielle and Jay are, were talking about there. So the first thing that, that we were talking about is the rising cost of insurance because the risk is increasing. So if your risk of something is, is increasing, the odds of a insurance coverage or a payout are increasing, and the only way to then cover for that is by increasing the cost of your insurance. And so we are seeing that right now, uh, as Danielle was going through, with a wildfire risk or with flood risk or with hurricane wind risk. If you look in California, um, the insurer of last resort uh, has doubled its policies on, almost on a yearly basis right now because there's so many insurance companies backing out. That does not mean it's the same price. That means the most at-risk properties are being concentrated within the state and they are charging a price that's commensurate with the risk, meaning you're paying a lot more. You can have two, three, four X your insurance costs instantly where you didn't know. You just get a letter of non-renewal and then you actually realize what is the true cost of risk for that property. When you have that happen to you, whether it's in Louisiana with citizens as the insurer of last resort, same name in Florida, whether it's in California, when that happens, the cost of ownership goes up. And when your cost of ownership goes up, the value of the real estate asset you're talking about goes down. If I have to pay more to maintain that home, that home's not gonna be worth as much to me if I'm looking to actually buy that and live in that property. And so that's what we're actually seeing right now is these higher insurance costs are having an impact on home values. It just is logical when someone's looking at it. And those are the types of impacts, the financial impacts that we see from climate. Then moving on to this sustainable lifestyle and what can we actually do, our models are showing us that people aren't necessarily moving away from these areas. We know the population in Florida is increasing and in Texas and all these great places that everyone wants to move to. Yeah. What we're actually seeing in our models is that it's a distribution of the population. In high-risk areas, people are moving from that census block, so think about 40 homes in a little area, to a different area in that neighborhood or in that county. They're not moving away. They're just relocating to an area that has less risk. So that's for things like flood, where it can be more concentrated in an area versus something like we're talking about with heat, which is just you're all going to experience it. So um, that's where we're actually pulling our models together to see that 9 million people have already moved in the last, uh, the last uh, 10 years or so um, from these pockets of high risk into other areas in these places. So those are what we are, are, are calling climate abandonment areas where you're actually seeing 
the population go down in small pockets in these census blocks. So you're seeing all of these things come together in real estate, in home values, and in population trends through our, our economists and through our demographers, as you were talking about, Jay. I think that's really interesting and you know, also another place for real estate professionals to increase their professionalism and their ability to advise and assist home buyers and home sellers with not only valuations, but as well as um, purchase risk, um, especially as you, as you commented, how it will impact, impact home valuations. I think that's really interesting because it's not just a matter of transitioning regions in terms of, you know, I moved from California, born and raised to Florida. That was a completely different experience for me. But also, too, for me living in Tampa, one area of Tampa being at greater risk for flood or fire or wind compared to 10 miles away and the valuation of that home and the cost of, of living. So I find that very interesting, and I think that that's definitely something I think real estate professionals should be leveraging a tool that like Realtor.com's tool um, that you guys are going to uh, show us this afternoon. I'm so excited for that, um, where people can evaluate those risks because I think that's going to definitely change the game and um, and and how we evaluate home purchase. So let's get into the future. You know, where do we go from here? Is is really the next um, how I would like to end this panel is talk about the future. How do we end? From, where do we go from here? How um, how, how do we impact quality of life, Jay? Like, like talk to us about, about how we be, have a more resilient future, especially as it relates to quality of life yeah. here in Texas. <laughs> right on. <laughs> that, that, is it. that is the key question, isn't it? So I say, again, let's go back and consider the global effects of climate change here, say, on Texas, the local effects of cities increasing, growing, and the urban heat island effect increasing. And then just imagine what your life will be like living Texas or wherever you may be living, but I'll use the example of Texas since I've been here uh, 34 years now. Got here as fast as I could. I was born in New York City. Uh, never thought I'd wind up living in Texas and uh, having native Texan children and dogs and uh, pet rats running around my backyard. Um, but I digress, right? Because what, what I like to ask everyone to think about is what your life will be like out in the future when there's 125 days a year where it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. Imagine you're working in construction. Maybe you're working as a first responder. What your life will be like there. But even if you work indoors in a very increasingly climate controlled uh, house, you work and you play in there, still imagine what your life will be like because you'll be sort of in your refuge, in your fortress of solitude or whatever it may be. Very different than I really enjoy the therapeutic benefits of being outside. Yeah. And we will be, in large part, denied that. So it really behooves us to ask, yeah, where, where might the solutions be coming from? And I think, ironically, a lot of the solutions may be just what we're talking about here, homeowners and choices that they're making, right, in terms of how much you want to invest your home being powered by renewable energy. That's one choice. Another choice is, how much of the land you own do you want covered with impervious cover? Because that's adding to that local urban heat island effect. So there is actually uh, a lot that people could do, you know, voting, all kinds of things we could do. Future climate change depends on current and future human behavior. And part of that human behavior is what we do as homeowners. And I'll just add one more thing, a uh, new project we've just started supported by the National Science Foundation at the University of Texas. It's all based around what we call community-based participatory research. That's where scientists and engineers and other researchers get together with community members, particularly those from underserved neighborhoods, and help conduct research together as a team between the university and the community, conduct research as a team to help increase the resilience, the climate resilience, the water resource resilience, of these neighborhoods. And uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I'll be happy to talk more about it, but for now, if you're interested, it's called Project Cressel, C-R-E-S-S-L-E. -E. If you Google Cressel and UTexas, uh, the project will pop up, and I think it's one way we could put science and engineering into action, much like my fellow panelists are doing. 
Well, I agree. I, I think education is so important, and it's getting educated first. Before we can make any changes, you have to become aware. And I love that what we're learning here today. Um, Matthew, can you talk to us about um, you know the bigger picture and you know what you see as some potential solutions um, for the future and you know building a more resilient uh, community? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the whole thesis behind First Street and why we do what we do is that we believe that with the right data, then you can understand the gravity of the situation that we face and then work towards solutions. So with the understanding of what will happen over the next 30 years, because it is not a question of if it will happen. The unfortunate situation is the emissions have already, are pretty much baked in for what will happen over the next 30 years. It's kind of past that, that we are making decisions on how that will change the outcome of the future. So we have to use this data to understand what we can actually do about it. And so when we're looking at things like health metrics, when we're talking about heat and air quality, so we talk about health and wealth a lot. So health metrics like that quality of life, how are we actually thinking about solutions that can make our lives better or that we can actually protect ourselves from that? So if you're talking about air quality, people don't generally know that your air conditioner has a filter on it. Uh, you probably are told to clean that filter and you forget about it all the time. But that is a main source of protection from air quality when you have wildfire smoke in the air, running that has a significant impact on the air quality that's inside. When you're looking at wildfire risk, you can do things like take away what's called the, the shrubs and everything and create what's called defensible space. So you don't want your home to be next to trees and shrubs that can then catch your home on fire. That is the number one way that a home combusts. And so you want to create that, which dramatically reduces the property's risk from wildfire. So these are all basic small things that you can do to make your home more resilient. But then we need things like more canopy cover to deal with heat. Um, we need to get rid of more impervious surface like Jay was talking about because that's what creates these urban heat islands and really, really changes the quality of life that someone has versus um, an area that has more grass or canopy cover or things of that nature. So there are all these solutions that we can work on together that just makes a city and a community more resilient or an individual structure more resilient that we need to be aware of and be working towards collectively. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Danielle, how about you? I, I think what Matt was saying is so vitally important. There are things that we can do, but we have to have the information about what the problems are mm -hmm. uh, in order to take the steps that we need to take to make the climate uh, or make ourselves more resilient for the future at the individual level and at the societal level. Um, so it's vitally important that consumers have this information when they're making decisions about where to live. And consumers come to Realtor.com to understand what's in the market for sale, what's in the market for rent, how do they need to uh, have the information on their home when they're living in their home. And so it's important that we put that information, the best data and science modeling, provided by First Street Foundation right into the product experience. So it's right where people are when they're making decisions. And it's not just about today and understanding the risks about today, but also preparing for tomorrow because homeowners are in their homes for the long term mm -hmm. and they need to think long term when uh, they're contemplating homeownership and what to do. And we know already that consumers are thinking about this. 90% of consumers report concerns about climate and natural disasters, and 70% of com current homeowners took climate and natural disaster into consideration when purchasing their home. So consumers are really hungry for this information, right. and it's important that we provide it. So I'm, I'm excited that we provide this information and excited to see where it takes us as a society. Well, I think it's great when you can be a thought leader in a space and pave the way um, for others to, um, to learn more and to, to get access to information that's not necessarily and always easy or readily available. Um, we are ready to open up to Q&A. So if you have not scanned the QR code, hopefully it will pop up on these windows here soon. Um, and so we'll, we'll be taking some questions here for the next few minutes. And um, I, I, I want to say also that it's, it's such a privilege and an honor to be in a space like this where we can talk about these things and learn and then share this messaging um, and, and help our real estate professionals as well as our homeowners be more educated as it relates to, to serving the consumer base. So I have a couple of uh, questions here. And um, let's start with this 
for the first question, and I think this will probably be a good J question slash Matt question, which is what does extreme heat mean? Like, what does that actually mean? I'll, I'll let you answer first, Jay. Sure. Well, extreme heat, uh, there's lots of ways you can define it, but it, simply it's heat that's well above the, the normal, right? We have natural variability, seasonal cycles. We have daily cycles, so highs and lows. But what we're looking at with extreme heat is that long term, those ups and downs are on a long term rise. And when the, the more we see that concentrated in a given area, the more extreme we see that heat is, right? So there's this global trend of increasing temperatures around the world on average. But what will happen in particular areas, for example, is that cities will see extreme heat more than the equivalent rural areas in the same space. And that's because of this urban heat island effect that I've mentioned, that Matt mentioned during, during our earlier comments. And so within a city, it's not just sort of this average. There's actually a distribution of extreme heat or the heat load or the excessive heat across a city and the parts of the city that have higher impervious cover see that higher load. There's a recent study that was done and it looked at dozens of major cities in the US and it actually followed along very closely along these uh, percent impervious cover boundaries, ironically, that were set a century ago when the federal government actually designated certain neighborhoods in certain cities as less desirable than others. And this was done largely on the basis of uh, socioeconomic status. And ironically, it's still today dictating where the worst places to live heat-wise are in a given city. Interesting. Um, Jay, can you answer this question for us, uh, from, submitted from Sarah? If I already live in a climate prone or climate risk prone area, what can I really do to mitigate against these risks besides making a move? Or, or, I'm sorry, yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. did Go I say ahead. Jay? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, you. the first thing you need to do is uh, you can see on realtor.com this great data that we provide. We have a, a tool as well called Risk Factor. So, riskfactor.com, which is the, the kind of synergistic play with, with Realtor.com where you can see all the information there and then click deeper to get even more information on our website. But really understanding what your personal property's risk is, which will give you an understanding of what you can do to actually make it more resilient. So you'll get stats from the property level. How likely is water to make it to the building? Uh, how likely are certain wind gusts to make it to the building? Or poor air quality days? Or as we were just talking about with extreme heat, we talk about the seven hottest days. It's the 98th percentile of heat. So what are those seven hottest days today and how will that change into the future? But you get more practical things like, what can I do to prevent damage from a flooding event if I'm in a high flood risk area? The beach is beautiful. Everyone wants to live next to the water, but that inherently comes with some risk. So what do you do about it? What is the elevation of your property? Have you raised your air conditioner so it's off the ground? These practical things and these solutions are all available there for you. So it's not just you can't do anything about it. It's all about know your risk and then take action. Know the risk for the community and take collective action. There's so many real solutions that we can deploy together. It's just a matter of understanding what you should put your energy towards given what your, your specific risk is in that area. You know, I, I was thinking this even as Danielle was speaking earlier. I wonder too if for example, I made a joke behind, backstage about how my mother-in-law is the only person I know that's owned her home longer than 30 years to actually have paid off her mortgage, right? Like it's, it just doesn't seem that common in today's, uh, gen for today's generations. And you know, I wonder if something like this will cause people to actually stay in their homes longer because they feel like they've mitigated and protected against climate change and because um, typically I think a lot of reasons why we move are you know, associated with the you know, uh, life changes and relocation and, and equity, right? And wanting to upgrade or downsize in our homes. Will climate change keep us in our homes longer? Would either of you like to comment on that? I, <clears throat> I will say I don't know that it will necessarily keep people in their homes longer, but I think whether they're there or whether they're going to sell to someone else when the time is right, I think 
having this data available and helping people understand the risk gives an incentive for homeowners to improve their properties to mitigate, mitigate against these risks. Right. It's going to be part of the conversation when shoppers are looking at homes um, and they have that information, they're going to want to know what improvements have you taken. You mentioned your in-laws. My in-laws happen to live in an area w which has a high flood factor or flood risk score. My father-in-law is not the biggest fan of this particular <laughs> product, but the case I make to him is, you know, look, you've elevated your property, you have made decisions to elevate your air conditioner, you have not experienced flooding when many of your neighbors have. Those are key marking points, not that he's going to sell anytime soon, but when he does decide to, to get to that point, that set his property apart, that might not be part of the conversation if consumers aren't thinking about this information and don't have it when they're making decisions. So good, interesting. And then what should homeowners start doing today to help with climate change? That was submitted by Jason. Um, would I, any of you like to take, take that one? Um, I'll have you, Danielle, take that one. What should homeowners start doing today to help with climate change? You know, I think um, thinking about you know, where they live and things that they can do to be more energy efficient, um, energy and water efficient, all of these are, are valuable resources that are so important. So. Um, taking steps to make sure that your, your home is well cared for and well sealed and well maintained so that you're using energy efficiently. You know, invest in technology so when you're not in a room, you can turn your lights off. And if you, you know, leave home and you forget to turn your lights off, you, know, you can use your phone to do that. Um, and, I, and I think uh, an important thing to think about is also landscaping. So much of, of this risk mm -hmm. can be uh, mitigated or improved based on landscaping. I mean, you've talked a lot about impervious surface. What that means is, is uh, space on the landscape that mm -hmm. water cannot penetrate. So right. cement, concrete, roofs, mm -hmm. um, but sort of uh, thinking about permeable driveways, for example, if you happen to have that, or permeable patios. There are ways to um, have the desired feature, like a driveway or a patio, but that are better for the climate than others. And I think just thinking about those options. Not sure if you want to add sure. there. Sure, and yeah, what exactly. I really like about that is what you could do locally to mitigate those effects, but all those things you're talking about, like mm -hmm. limiting impervious cover, are also effectively serving to sequester carbon more, and uh, that's helping with the global problem. So we can act locally and globally at the same time around our homes. Yeah, and Jay, did you have any other thoughts on that specific question? What should homeowners start doing today to help with climate change? Do you have any tips? And I think, Matt, I'll have you I think Matt and Danielle have already, have already brought up a, a number of good, uh, good ones. Uh, if we're in a drought-prone climate, we could start collecting rainwater. That's mm -hmm. a, a, another very effective thing to do uh, to conserve water. Reuse of gray water. Holy cow. So don't get me started on this. But, um, so gray water, we wash our hands, it goes down the sink. Right, and, and we're done with it. And it, we use tap water that's been cleaned by the municipal agency, like Austin Water in, in our city, cleans up our, our, our water, sends it to our homes, and we use it to wash our hands and then we're done with it. We actually use it to pee into, right? Our toilet is filled up with drinking water quality water. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of time, energy, to pump clean, to clean the water up, to pump it around town. Uh, it takes a big carbon footprint to do all of that. And we're just sort of, peeing it away, if you will, right? Do we have to pee? I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep coming back to that word. Do we have to do our business in water that's drinkable? So instead, we could reuse gray water, right? So the water, you wash your hands, it goes down the sink, that's gray water. It could go right into the fill up your toilet tank. And that would be conserving water in a big way. Now that's hard to do, uh, Kendall, right? If you own a home, it could be hard to do. I know I've talked with contractors. Yeah, it's gonna require PVC piping, check valves, all the rest. It's not a big contracting job at all, but it's not a simple DIY for someone like me who can't knock down a wall and do anything with it, right? But instead, all these new homes, if we're gonna have twice as many Texans, all to design a new home with that is really easy. It's just a simple line on a blueprint, and we could reuse so much more gray water than we currently do, which is almost next to nothing. Right. It's interesting. It makes me think about, um, you know, I have children and, you know, you're supposed to teach them to brush their teeth for two minutes. And it's like, okay, well, make sure you turn the water off while right. you're brushing your teeth. And, you know, just different things like little small things, washing dishes, you know, using the dishwasher as opposed to 
you know, washing them by hand with running water while you do that, for example. Just little small things I can think of like that I think would have an impact. Matt, did you want to add anything to that question? Because I know yeah. you... Yeah, no, the, the, the things that we, we haven't hit on yet, um, when you're heating your home, cooling your home, that all takes energy. And so those are things to be aware of when you actually see your heating bill. There's lots of um, uh, state level utilities now that are providing you with a comparison to your neighbors. You use 70% more energy than your neighbors. And those are small little nudges to tell you that you're not doing something right, <laughs> that you can actually have a more efficient home. Those small things add up for 330, 350 million Americans. And so when you're thinking about actual utilization of cooling systems, one degree cooler, two degree cooler in your home, um, that actually adds up. Or you can add things like solar panels, or you can do things like buy clean energy credits for your actual um, heating and cooling systems. Th those are all things that you can do as an individual that have a big meaningful impact when it comes to the actual greenhouse gases and the overall issue that we're, we're talking about today. Matt, I'm going to come back to you for this question submitted by James Greer. Um, if a homeowner conducts mitigation measures for their property, such as wildfire, wildfire prepared home, is there a risk reduction presented in the risk score? Because I know that we can go down to the home, correct? Like we can get super detailed into the risk factors per house. Is that something that's taken into consideration? Yeah. Great question. So there's uh, two different types of, of risks when you're talking about physical climate. Uh, so that physical climate change being the flood, fire, heat, drought, all of those things. Uh, one is exposure. How likely is this property to be impacted by this thing? And then consequence data. If that happens, what happens to the property? And so the exposure is what our scores are based off of. So you can have a high flood factor, as Danielle was talking about with her in-laws, where you might have an extreme risk of flooding, but the home is 10 feet off the ground because it's elevated, and so there's no consequence of that event happening. So you still have a high exposure, a high score, but you have no consequence of the event. So we have both sets of data when we're presenting it. The reason we have the exposure as the score base is because that's the indicator of you should be aware that there is a risk here. And so when it comes to wildfire, we're actually giving the exposure of the likelihood of wildfire to reach the building. And so if you've done things to protect that property where wildfire will not reach the building, you'll see a drop in the score when you actually we rerun it every single year. So given all the wildfires that happen in a given year, it changes what are the fuels, the forest area or the shrubs and all of those things that can combust. And so we actually have to take that into account before we rerun it. So we see what happens with satellite imagery every single year and we use that in the new run. So if something's been done to mitigate risk from actually being exposed, we will quantify that and then that will change the actual score for that property. No, so interesting. So uh, one last question um, from Jeremy. You know, what research or questions are still waiting to be answered to help address the problems around climate change and housing? Um, and I, I will ask all three of you if you have something to submit for that. Is there still some research to be done? Is there a question that's still left to be asked and, then, and answered for that matter? Jay, do you have um, a thought on that? I do. Um, I'll take a, a little bit of a different uh, spin on this. I think everything we've been talking about has been vitally important, right? What can we do to uh, reduce the risk of our homes, right? But there's this larger problem that we're looking at, right? It's global climate change. And what we've been doing has been very, talking about something very uh, home-centric, right? Family-centric. And it's vitally important that we do that, that we protect ourselves. But the larger issue is, can we actually mitigate against the worst effects that are to come? Mm -hmm. And that's going to take changes on many fronts. It's going to take changes in policy, international accords, advancing technologies to whether we're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, whether we're coming, advancing renewables so it can actually replace fossil fuels. There's a lot of complex, hard questions about it. And my feeling is too often we, we devolve into, well, let me just, you know, put up the walls around me so that I'm going to be doing okay. But if we don't address that larger problem, then we will still get the worst outcome by and large. And so for me, I think it's very important to always remain uh, optimistic. We often hear too often that, 
you know what, to make this, these changes are coming, there's nothing we can do about it. We might as well enjoy what we got while we got it while we're here and not worry about making the change. Because those changes are, are hard, but they're possible. And it's only if a critical enough mass of people in the world are optimistic that change can occur, that there's a chance for a good outcome. Once a critical enough mass of people in the world uh, are pessimistic about it and say, worst is to come and we can't do anything about it, then we know what the outcome will be. Mm. So I maintain we have no choice but to be very optimistic about our future. I love it. And we will end with that because we are going to stay optimistic about the future. And I optimistically hope that you will join us for our happy hour and our immersive experience. So please don't leave. And um, we are just so thankful for you for joining us today. And I'm so thankful for our panelists. And if you don't mind giving them a round of applause for their time. <laughs> and, and Thank you. Thanks,